Hey, good morning, church. A couple announcements because it's December, it's Christmas time. We got some big things happening. Next Saturday is the dress rehearsal for our Christmas program starting at 10 to 2. And lunch is provided, so please be sure if your kids are a part of that uh, to be here. And then the play is next Sunday. This is information that's in your bulletin uh, to next Sunday night at 6. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and that's, that's just around the corner. Christmas is coming up. And, and, you know, as we get closer to Christmas, as we get closer to this time, really, it's really one of the two holidays of the Christian calendar, at least. That's the climax of what our faith is all about. Uh, we're, we're doing a series through Advent, the coming of Jesus. Not just his first coming, but also looking forward to the second coming of Christ. That's what these candles are for. That's why last week when we went and we talked about hope and what Christ brings us hope, and we went and we sang with at the nursing home. Uh, that was the candle of hope. And this week, we're talking about the candle of peace. Christ, the bringer of peace. I want to read for us as we get started here. I just want you to listen to this and close your eyes as we read from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. For a child will be born to us. A son has been given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, he will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let's pray this morning. Lord, as we discuss this morning what real peace is and what it is offered for those who are listening today, wherever we're at in our faith, Lord, I ask that you would work through me this morning and speak clearly so that people, including myself, can understand what it's like to live a life with the Prince of Peace as their King. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peace is hard to come by now. Uh, this is a study done all the way back in June. I checked the stats from a study that was published on Tuesday. None of these numbers have gone do down in the last four or five months. But if you look at this, I don't know if you can read all of it. Um, just, just within adults in America, uh, about 31% are experiencing some form of anxiety with depression. 11% seriously considered suicide. It's a really large number. For ages 18 to 25, the number is as high as 25% in the last 30 days have considered this. Trauma, stressors, related disorder symptoms, 26. Started or increased substance use, 13%. People are tense. And by people, I mean us. I mean the people in this room. I mean myself included in this are tense, stressed, not really feeling a lot of peace, or at least, at the very least, not experiencing a peaceful time, difficult times. And it's going to take years for us to even begin to understand all the psychological problems, the mental health problems that have been caused over this last year. We don't fully even understand it. We know it's significant, though. We know that peace is hard to come by in the midst of all of this. And you don't have to go very far in this room to find people struggling with that. Few people have opened up to me about this. I've opened up to a few people about my own anxiety and depression through this. A lot of people are still doing it in silence, but you don't have to go very far to find people who aren't experiencing peace. And yet, this is what we read, 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. And in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, in, in Psalm 85, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful 
servants. Now we're going to get into today what it really means to have peace. We're going to talk about what that word really means for us today in light of Christ. But I want us to see this opportunity what's before us. At no point in our history have we been this aware of how anxious we actually are. People who used to suffer in silence, it's almost like that thing that was silently killing them, is now vocal aloud in a throbbing pain. And there's this promise of peace that we have in Christ. If we take advantage of this moment, if we seize this moment and show and understand ourselves what the peace of Christ really is, to use a phrase, we can comfort people with the same comfort we've received. Why do I phrase it that way? Let me just say it clearly from 2 Corinthians, while Paul's reflecting on his own discomfort. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and a God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions, who comforts us in our difficulties, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Finally, in James 2.16 If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In other words, part of our responsibility as Christians, part of our job, if you will, when we are in this place, when we're talking to people here and when we're outside, is to find suffering and to comfort those who are suffering. To find those who do not have peace and to bring them the same peace that you and I received. Which logically means that you and I have to know what that is. We have to be comforted first before we can comfort everyone else. And here is the tough part. If God has so clearly promised peace, if part of his name is the Prince of Peace, if part of his coming is supposed to be the celebration of peace, he's promised peace to everyone, then why is it so hard to find peace? What actually is peace? promised. You know, we can comfort people by saying, well, just trust in Jesus. Well, what did Jesus actually promise you that you can trust in? That's what we're talking about this morning. See, we can sit here today or we can sit at home watching this recording. We can hear these uplifting passages about Jesus offering peace, and it doesn't make sense with our current situation because it feels like we're not experiencing a whole lot of peace right now. It certainly feels like it's a difficult time. It feels like God has, for whatever reason, abandoned us in a situation. How do you point to peace in that? What does peace even mean in that situation? Really, my goal today is not just to make us feel better and about experiencing what we're going through. My goal is for us to understand what peace in Christ actually looks like at all. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 3.15, kind of a guiding verse for us if we have any for this morning. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. All of this to ask a simple question that we're going to look at for the rest of this morning. How do we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts? If wave after wave of hard times are coming and it doesn't seem like there's really a definitive end of difficulty, how do we let this rule in our hearts? What does this look like? That's what I want to look at today. And I just have two points points in, uh, to give us on this. And I hope this will be helpful and encouraging for you. So how do we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts? First of all, we let peace be on God's terms. The Romans, they had this phrase, the very common phrase, because they built all these roads to their empire. It was a safe empire. You could expect no war to be happening within your empire if you were a Roman. It went around saying, Pax Romana, peace of Rome. And it was a promise that if you wanted to go from North Egypt and Alexandria all the way over to Rome and you were delivering wheat, you were promised safe passage. There would be no real difficulties for you. And at least for them, peace was quite simple. It means that there's no conflict. It was a time of peace. For them, war is the opposite of peace. And if we're not careful, 
That can be the type of peace that we search after. A peace in Christ where we avoid difficulties because we don't think that's really what God wants for us in our life. Where we judge God's involvement in our peace, in our life, in our heart, based on how easy things are. Not quite the same type of peace that Christ is calling us to. I'll put it this way. It's good that you let God answer your questions, but you need to also let him tell you the questions you ought to be asking. If you pick up the scriptures and you want to find answers, you'll find them, but also listen to what it's asking. What is actual peace in Christ? See, we can think and go to God thinking we know what real peace is, but unless we let him teach us what peace is, then you will never find it because you're going into it expecting something entirely different. Consider what happens to the Prince of Peace for a moment. He's tortured, crucified, and goes off and dies by the Romans who offer this peace. In fact, and one way of saying it is that Jesus died so that the world could be more peaceful in Rome. They were so afraid he would build this uprising. That's the type of peace they were after. But if the Prince of Peace, if he is the Prince of Peace and he goes and he dies, what does that tell us about those who are his servants, about what real peace looks like? Think even for a moment in Colossians chapter 3, when Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, when he's writing this in 63 AD or whatever it is, he's writing this from prison. Likely the only light coming in while he's writing this or dictating this is a little bit of a hole on the ground, because he's in a hole on the ground in Rome, in prison. People have to bring him food or else he's not eating. He's being tortured. He's being whipped three times. He's about to be beheaded by the Romans. And this is the guy. This is the man who says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What is Paul saying? Listen to what Jesus says in John Really, the best definition I think that we have in Scripture of what peace is comes from here. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. It's different than the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And then in that same discussion with the, with the apostles, John sixteen thirty three, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on the earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. He's giving them peace. He's promising them peace. The next sentence in that promise is that they will face trials, sorrows, that they'll have difficult times. So what is peace that Christ gives? It's not as the world gives. It's not simply the avoidance of difficulty. What is real peace on Christ's terms? See, God gives us peace not by taking away trials, not by taking away difficulty, but by making any difficulty that comes our way unable to harm us, to truly harm us. I've enjoyed reading this year some of the early Christian martyrs, and the last words that they say before they go up and are eaten by lions or shot with arrows or thrown in boiling pots of oil, however you wanted to kill them, there's a lot of these phrases that they used, and it really illustrates this point most clearly. There was a Christian by the name of Justin in the second century, and he knows he's going to die. He's writing to the Romans. He's telling, trying to tell them basically why they don't have to kill the Christians, why they don't have to be afraid of him. And at the end of it, he kind of just throws all his cards out on the table. And he tells them plainly, you can kill me, but you cannot harm me. Real peace, to say it plainly, is not the avoidance of difficulty, not the avoidance of pain or trials or sorrow, but to recognize what real peace is, is to see contentment, take heart in those moments. The peace of God is not the avoidance of difficulty, but the taking heart in the midst of difficulty. People need to hear that right now. 
there's not something wrong with you because you're having a hard time. That doesn't mean that you're being less faithful. That is actually God giving you the opportunity to learn to rest in Him. Will you take advantage of what He has given you? To say it plainly, your pain and your difficulty in your life, no matter how extreme it might seem in that moment, how unes- unescapable, to the point where so many people are considering ending their own life, however dark that might seem, it's not stronger than what it means to be the Prince of Peace. Listen to what God tells us through Peter. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Echoing all the way back from Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. Please hear me this morning. I'm not saying that God won't give you moments of rest and moments of peace and avoidance of difficulty. What I am saying is this. In the midst of this, right now in your life, where things seem dark, dim, and so unhopeful, we have this promise in Christ that He cares for us enough that we can cast His anxiety on Him. While it's true that I think the greatest thing I've contributed to my own salvation is the sin that I needed to be rescued from, God is not sitting there angry at us and therefore punishing us again and again. So you can sort of view God and His peace and all forgiveness as this transaction, as if He's this cashier waiting for this price to be paid, and so once that price is paid, then He can start really being nice to us. All the way back, think of what the imagery is used to describe our relationship with God as the bride of Christ in Genesis, as an unfaithful people that He is reaching out to us in Leviticus and Exodus. And all through the Scriptures, we're called the bride, the son, the friend, the brother of Christ. Those are not words of a God who hates you. Those are words of a God who demonstrates His own love for you. But while you were still sinners, He came and He died for you. He's not waiting for you to figure your life out before He gives you peace. He is calling you to cast your anxiety on Him now because He cares for you. Learn to view the difficulties in your life as opportunities to experience God's peace in a way that you can't at other times. And you will become untouchable to the extent that nothing in your life can happen that is too big for God's comfort that we comfort each other with and that we receive from Christ. There's such great joy that can come from that if you really believe that. He's not promised you an easy life, but He has promised to be with you through it. I could end us with us that now, but I, I, I have to share this next thing with you. How do we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts? We focus on what is ahead. I have seen the same chick flick plot about 138 times at this point in my life, and I can predict what's going to happen in the movie in the first 10 minutes, usually, about 85% of the time when I'm watching a movie with Mallory. And to be fair, some of my movies are just as predictable in their own way. Um, but other times, the story kind of throws me through a loop. I don't expect that person to get sick and actually die, or I don't expect someone or something bad to happen, and it throws me through a loop, and I don't know how the story ends, and suddenly I become interested. Because since I don't know how the story ends, that stuff in the middle actually really matters for me, really is difficult to understand what's going on. See, with all books and all movies, if you know how the story ends, those middle chapters, no matter how bad they seem in the moment, no matter how difficult it sounds or how tragic or hopeless it may feel at that time, no matter what chapter happens, chapter happens, it's all going to be okay if you know how the story ends, if you know what's really awaiting for the good guy in the end. We're living in the middle of the story. Let me read for you the last page of our story. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. 
And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, that's us, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's how this story ends. No matter how difficult these chapters in the middle seem, no matter how hopeless they may appear, this has been written. And this is what's going to happen in the end. I talk a lot, I know, about my family, about my brother on stage. And frankly, it's just the most clearest way that I've seen the grace of God work in my life. So I I enjoy talking about it. Um not necessarily because I enjoy talking about the pain he caused, but because this scar tells the story of Christ in my life in a a way other stories just don't. Um, And I want to share with you what I'm holding, what he gave me um, since sort of his conversion as prison. He's serving several life sentences in prison. And uh, through a long story short, he recently was, was given several hundred dollars, and he decided to buy all the family members these little compasses. Uh, and there's a, there's a real story behind this that I have to go back to all the way back from when we were growing up with my mom. She would tell us frequently and remind us often that her number one goal as a mom was to see all of her kids with her in heaven. Uh, my dad sort of took this one step further. This is going back all over 20 years in our family now. He got on his, on his license plate, a custom license plate, uh, Judah Gate which was supposed to be and still is the plan of the Nichols family for all of us to meet when we're in heaven at the Judah gate so we can be reunited. And my brother, you know, heard this growing up. He wasn't really a faithful person coming to prison and sitting there and thinking and emailing and talking to my father and I. He's had a real change of heart to such an extent now that he's planning on meeting us there at Judah gate where my family is going to be reunited one day. And so he wanted to do something special, um, something memorable, because this was really a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He's probably never going to get a chance again to buy all of uh, his his family anything again. So he got us these little compasses. And just on the compass, it simply says, Judah Gate, Revelation 21, verse 12. And... The goal in this is to remember where we're headed. That no matter where he's at now, no matter what cell he's going to sit in for the rest of his life, no matter where I'm at in my life, we're going to that same place. And no matter what happens in this life, no matter what difficulty or trial happens, I can have peace because I know where my future is going. So bring it on. Bring me trials and errors because the God of all comfort is not going to take away what the end is going to bring me. The peace of Christ, at least the peace for my life and for my family that we have found in Christ, is not that we're all together now. It's not that we're all doing well and healthy and avoiding difficulties. That's not what real peace is. The real peace of Christ that is promised with the coming of Jesus himself, is that we know where we're going. So these these middle chapters, they're not as vital as we might think they are. It's not as dreadful as it really is. No matter the difficulty in the middle of my life, I am confident that I am going to meet my family there at Judah Gate. And that's my goal and my job to bring as many people with me as I want and can. I want to read for you one final passage from Philippians chapter 3. I hope to bring all of this home. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings. Becoming like Him in His death and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or I have already arrived at my goal. 
But I press on to take hold that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. Whereas he says in Philippians chapter 1, it has been granted to us, gifted to us, to participate in the sufferings of Jesus. No, the peace that God offers us, the peace that I am talking about this morning, is not that you're going to go from here and live a long and happy life without any difficulties. No, the real peace, and this is the peace that I hope you know that we can share with others is that even in the midst of those difficulties, we are heaven-bound and promised that future. And in a dark world, in a world where the light does not go into the darkness, and the darkness does not understand it, this is all from John 1.1, we know this. In a dark world, it doesn't seem like there is that much hope for us. In fact, it seems oftentimes in the midst of difficulty, that God has abandoned us. And what we're reminded of today, I hope that you're reminded of today, and what I'm calling all of us to do, is to let it, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts through faith. What does that look like? It means having a hard day and believing your future anyway. So would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you for the promise of those gates and the promise of heaven and of, and of where we're going. May we be focused on that direction and may we forget all that is behind us and strive towards the goal which you have given us through Jesus. Lord, give us the peace. Give us the true shalom that you have promised your people since the beginning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.